Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are doctors Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates, and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. Good afternoon, Laura. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, so excited to have you here to share your birth story. I'm excited as well. So let's just dive in and ask you to start telling us a little bit about yourself and maybe your journey into pregnancy. Okay. So my name is Laura and I live in Tofino, British Columbia on Vancouver Island, not too far away from you guys in Victoria. And I guess my journey to pregnancy was a fairly long but short. I'm 39 years old and my partner and I have been together for 10 years and we waited a long time before we decided that we were going to try to have a baby. But so that part was long, but actually getting pregnant ended up being pretty fast. I didn't know how long it was going to take just given my age. And I don't know, I'd never tried before and never had any kind of scares or anything throughout my life. So I just didn't know what it would be like, but it ended up only taking a couple of months. Oh, wow. So, Great. Especially because you're 30, were you 38? Were yes, you exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I just didn't know what was going to happen, but it all worked out for the best. Good. Yeah. And how was pregnancy for you? It was a little bit wild. The first, I got very sick. <laughs> Morning, day, night, sickness, all of it. The first, I would say, I don't know, 16, 18 weeks were what I would describe as a write-off. Luckily, it was during a peak COVID time. So I was working from home. So that made it a lot easier because I didn't have to try to fake how I was feeling. And I got to wear sweatpants every day. I didn't have to really hide it from anyone. I ended up telling my boss much earlier than probably people usually share, but only because I really didn't know how it was going to go. And I feel like if I had been working at the office, I would have probably taken some leave because I was really quite sick, but it started to mellow out. But I ended up taking diclectin yep. throughout my entire pregnancy. And there were, it was a small dose, but if I would forget to take it the next day, I would wake up and be really sick. So mm -hmm. I was really glad to have that little tool in my toolkit. You're one of the few, I think it's only about 20% of people who have that sort of morning quotation, morning sickness. Yeah, exactly. Fancy. Yeah, that's what I've heard. So luckily my sister has two kids and she was very sick throughout her entire pregnancies as well. Although I, she has some other medical issues that kind of contributed to that. But I, at least with the diclectin, it, it mellowed out and I wasn't feeling sick unless I forgot to take it. So I, it became manageable. Yeah. Good. And other than, you know, that lovely sickness, how would, pregnancy... yeah, I guess that's the main thing I remember from being pregnant, but yeah. other than that, it was fairly straightforward. Honestly, I have anemia and low iron. I knew that going into being pregnant. So I did get some iron transfusions later on in the pregnancy and those were really helped because my iron was quite low. And other than that, other than some like pelvic pain that kind of hit me into the third trimester, I would say I, I did pretty well. Good. Yeah. Good to hear. Not everybody has sort of smooth pregnancy. So I'm glad things were. I know. Yeah. I felt pretty lucky right around the time when all the nectarines come into season was when I was doing my gestational diabetes tests and I got flagged on the first one for the second one. And I was so nervous because it's my favorite time of year to eat all the good fruits, Yeah, but I didn't end up um, having it. So I was really lucky, but I, there was a bit of time where I was nervous, but 
a bit of a scare. I know. Yes. But I, I feel know. really lucky that I made it through relatively unscathed, I guess you could say. I know there's so many different complications and mm-hmm. hard things that happen to the body. And yeah, so he I've... went into Fina. Oh, so for those of those listeners who don't know, it's quite remote there. It is. It's a remote community on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So we do have a hospital here and obviously a medical clinic, but we're not able to give birth in Tofino. So the closest hospital uh, really for any major medical situation would be Port Alberni, which is an hour and a half drive. On a terrible road. Yes, with lots of construction at the moment. Not the most comfortable situation if you were to go into labor in town and need to drive out. So we, this is similar to many like smaller and remote communities, but it's suggested, I should say that we leave around 36 weeks or 30, yeah, 36 weeks. So how did you, so you connected with our clinic here in Victoria for prenatal care, but how did you navigate that? Did you have all your prenatal care done here? Did you have some done closer to home? So I had most of my prenatal appointments with my family doctor here in town. And then um, he wasn't really familiar with too many uh, doctors to refer me to in Victoria. And that's where we knew we wanted to come because we have some family in Victoria and we were able to organize a house swap with a family friend. So we had a place to stay, which worked out really well. For those of you who know Victoria, it was in Cook Street Village. So we had lots of great walks and delicious food and all that kind of thing. So it was a good place to be, to wait it out. But I connected with your clinic actually, because I followed you on this account on Instagram. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess somebody probably sent me a post or somehow I had found it. And then I had been following for a while and then realized that you were in Victoria. And so I thought, oh, I'm not going to know the doctors anyways. So hopefully I can get in with this clinic because I was really enjoying kind of the content and the philosophies and things that you were talking about. So it worked out really well. Amazing. Perspective. Yeah. So lucky to have you. Yeah. Can you share just what that experience is having to leave your home community? Like in a, for a month, right? It was a long time. And for myself, whenever I talk about this, I feel like I have to preface with saying that I ended up in a situation where, you know, I had a lot of resources available to me. I ended up with a free place to stay and all of the things that worked out for me contributed to me having a really positive birth experience and feeling very well supported outside of my home and outside of my community. But I know that it's not like that for a lot of people. And it's something that I'm obviously acutely aware of because of my own situation, but something I'm more interested in kind of researching and figuring out what the different reasons are for that. And I'm not going to pretend to know all of the nuances of the medical system and I get it. It's a really small population here, but it was really challenging for me, even with all of the resources that I had available to me. It's such a vulnerable time. And I spent so much time nesting hard in my house. Every pantry was organized. Everything was where it needed to be. And then I felt like I just packed up my car and drove away. And I remember saying to Liam, like, this is the cleanest the house is ever going to be. And we don't even get to enjoy it because we're just leaving now and when we come back we're gonna have a new little roommate and it's never gonna be the same so it was comical in that way but it was definitely challenging it's you just drive away from your house for the last time knowing that when you come back you're gonna have a baby and you're just in a different city waiting for your whole life to change yeah yeah it's so hard and I think you're right like you you had so many resources for so many people who live in more rural and remote communities and especially for indigenous women it's you're taken away from your whole support system exactly and it's unfortunate because it should be such a happy time and it should be a time where you feel the most supported and for a lot of people I can imagine you end up a lot of women will end up in staying in a motel or in a hotel alone away from their support system and there's yeah just so many challenges that come along with that but for us, we were, like I said, we were really lucky. Victoria is a place that's really familiar to us. I went to university there and lived there for quite a long time. So I had friends there. All of the places were familiar to me. We have some family, extended family there. So it was a good place for us to be. But if we didn't have that, I don't know. I don't know if it, if I would be sharing the same story with you today. Yeah. And I think it's just important to acknowledge that 
the challenge that many people experience. Yeah. And I know it's something that's coming to light more. It's Mm -hmm. been an ongoing challenge, I think, for so many women, but it seems to be something that's, there's more light being shed on that challenge and kind of things are happening for ways to mitigate that and make it easier for people. And especially in the more remote communities, for sure. Obviously it would, it doesn't seem reasonable to imagine that we would have a full functioning birth center in Tofino for, I guess with, you cool it Tofino and the surrounding communities, you're looking at about maybe 5,000 people. It's not a lot of people to fund and function a a full birthing center. So yeah, yeah. but it's just Putting it out there, I think. Exactly. I, some people might not have been, ever known that that's an experience that some pregnant people have. Exactly. Yeah. So let's let's set the stage. So you're now here in Victoria. Yeah. 30 weeks. And you're like, okay, now I'm just waiting. Now I'm just waiting. I was working remotely for the first couple of weeks, which was good because I tend to, I'm a bit of a busy person. I like to be doing stuff. So I think the first couple of weeks, it was good to continue working because I felt busy and time was passing quickly. And then, yeah, once I stopped working, it was like comical because I just didn't really know what to do with myself. We, our dog was with us, but because of that, the pelvic pain that I was feeling, I couldn't really go on epic long walks with her or anything. So I would just go for short jaunts. I was hitting the mall a lot. I, it was also really, it was like the rainiest Mm. fall Mm -hmm. that we probably had. So it was torrential raining. I want to say like almost the entire time, which normally wouldn't bother me when you're trying to find things to kill time. Being outside is a nice one. So yeah, I became a bit of a mall rat. I hit all the baby shops, found all the good deals, ate a lot of really good food. And Nico ended up being 12 days late or 10 days, 10 days late. (laughs) So on top of the month that we were waiting Then we had another little bit of time after that, which seemed to be the longest days that I've ever experienced in my entire life, which I'm Uh, sure any woman who's past their due date feels. Yeah. Yeah. It's just your body that you have no. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So 10, 10 days, was it that you said? Yes. 10 days. So how did things start for you? In terms of my labor. So I was actually scheduled to be induced on the Monday, but I went into labor on Sunday afternoon or like the beginning stages. And it was really mild at first. And actually Liam, my partner was in disbelief. He's kept saying, I don't think it's real. I don't think anything's happening. And I had to agree because at this point, nothing had really been going on, but I called one of my girlfriends and she just, they just started laughing at us and said, you're 10 days over your due date. You're definitely like, it's happening. (laughs) <laughs> this is happening and she's you should probably have some dinner take a bath have a shower do what you need to do watch some Netflix and just settle in here and see what happens in yeah. the night so that's what we did we went out and had dinner and then I came home and had a nice shower and like blow dried my hair and did a face mask like just because I thought yeah. I'm probably not going to get to do this for a really long time so here it is you yeah. watched some Netflix and then we went to bed and then I guess, yeah, I probably woke up at like maybe 11 or 12, like midnight. And that's when I confirmed, yes, I in fact am in labor. <laughs> so things just getting more intense. Yeah. Things just started getting more intense and it was funny because we didn't really, we realized in the moment that we had talked with our doctors a lot about when to go to the hospital if something was wrong, yeah. but not when to go to the hospital when everything was cruising along at normal. So we were laughing because we realized, oh, there's one sort of key piece of information here <laughs> that we yeah. missed. If someone told us we forgot or weren't paying attention, we had one of those like contraction timer apps, yeah. which I'm sure are very helpful. Didn't help us. I ended up having back labor. So I couldn't tell yeah. when the contractions were starting or ending. So they, the timer was all over the place. It went from 10 minutes to two minutes to this. And then all of a sudden, like an hour after I'd woken up, mm-hmm. it started flashing, go to the hospital oh, yes. oh, immediately. Oh, immediately. Oh, and we were, we just start, we had to laugh because we said, well, that seems to be escalating very quickly. This doesn't seem right. So Liam called the doctor on call. I'm yep. not sure who it was at the clinic, 
could have even been you for all I know. And she just said, you know what? It's better to just go in and check and Mm -hmm. see what happens. Worst thing is that they'll send you home. So that's what we ended up doing. But a little while later, like I think maybe around three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So we headed off to the hospital, which was actually a pretty decent ride because Mm -hmm. it was in the middle of the night. So there was no traffic and it was relatively fast. I had a hat over my eyes the whole time anyways. So I didn't see anything. But when we got there, we discovered that I was actually only one centimeter dilated. Devastating in the moment for me because I did not want to get back in the car. (laughs) And also, I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, that means it's going to get so much more intense than what I'm feeling right now. They gave me a shot of morphine and I guess mixed with gravel so that I could go home and go to sleep and it took the edge off of it. So we got home, I think from the hospital, probably around five o'clock in the morning. And then I was able to sleep quite a few hours and I definitely was in pain, but I was not super aware Mm -hmm. of what was going on. And that's when I really started to go like turn inward to myself. And I had taken a hypnobirthing course. Oh, cool. And you did? Yes. I went with Melanie from Better Birth Stories. Okay. That's what it's called. I'm drawing a blank right now. But yes, because I had heard it on your podcast. Basically, everything that you did, I just said, I'm getting on board with whatever they say, because I wanted to make sure that everybody that we were interacting with it, we were all just on the same page. Yeah, and I thought that was really important. Yeah. I had read a book early on in my pregnancy called Like a Mother. I'm not sure if you've heard yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 Angela Garbs. Yeah. And I, one of the key takeaways that really stuck out to me, obviously knowing that I was going to be leaving my community to give birth was that a lot of things other than actual physical birth trauma, like physical things that happen to cause trauma is women feeling unsupported or yeah. unheard yeah. or acting with their caregivers. So I really wanted to be open-minded about everything that was going to happen during the labor time. And yeah, I just decided to get on board with the things that you were, your clinic was teaching in your accounts and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I went for the hypnobirthing. It was amazing. I would say for people who are thinking about going down that road, in the moment of actually being in labor and giving birth, I was not listening to the audio clips that they had or anything like that. But I was able to really, I just heard Melanie's calm, soothing British accent voice in my mind for 24 hours straight, basically just telling me how to breathe and these visualizations, which was so helpful. And even just leading up to going into labor, I listened to the like affirmations and audio clips at night when I was going to bed. And I felt like that really helped ease my anxiety of labor. Part of the reason why I waited so long to have kids was because I haven't really been around a lot of women who have kids or have given birth. My sister's quite a bit older than me and geographically we're not close together. So I wasn't around when she was pregnant or in labor. And so a lot of the preconceived notions I had were from what I saw in movies and TV and that kind of thing. And so I was very scared to get pregnant and give birth. And even though I knew once I became pregnant and was more aware, I knew that those things weren't real. It just really helped ease my anxiety going in, going into it. So highly recommend if anyone's like on the fence it was worth taking the course I thought it was really interesting just to learn exactly what was happening and hear different perspectives different language to use in the moments to kind of make you think about what's actually happening in your body and that kind of thing so it was really helpful so yeah once I got home from the hospital the first time that's when I really started to go inward and focus on those visualizations and things and Then we ended up going back to the hospital, I would say probably around 11 in the morning. I came out of my fog and (laughs) exited the bedroom and said, it's time. And it was sort of, I don't know, there's so many funny things I feel like in retrospect, but Liam's brother came to stay with us in Victoria for a couple of weeks before we had the baby. And partially it was because we hadn't seen him in quite a long time. He'd been living overseas for many years and had just recently moved back to Canada, but also we needed someone to help us with our dog in the time, which 
it was important because we didn't know how long we would be at the hospital. It could be days, it could be just a few hours, et cetera. So Nigel decided he was going to come out and stay. And even though I know him, I've actually only met him twice. So it was a very weird time to be getting to know your brother-in-law when you're nine months pregnant and just waiting it out and like waddling around to eat an ice cream. (laughs) So I remember walking out of the bedroom and seeing Nigel and saying, hi, Nigel. And the look on his face, just, I was like, yep, I think it's time for me to go to the hospital. Just by the way he looked at me. Yes. He's just like, oh my God, don't your baby here. Yeah, exactly. He's like, okay, this is what's been happening. Because he just probably could hear me like through the door. Yeah. So then we went for our second ride to the hospital, which was not even anywhere close to as peaceful as the first one. It was horrifying. I remember those rides. Yeah, not good, I would say. Anyways, we got to the hospital. I feel like it took me 45 minutes just to get in from the parking lot because I kept having to stop. Time really at that point was a blur. So I don't know actually how long it took me, but it felt like minutes were taking hours to pass. And then we got settled in, we got checked and the nurse said, okay, you're about five centimeters dilated. So we'll get you all set up here. And I had just said, great, because I wasn't planning on actually leaving. Again. <laughs> Regardless of what, yeah, <laughs> whatever you had told me, I was just going to be yeah. here. Yeah. So I'm glad that you're happy about that, that you're willing to have me stay. We don't have to have any conflicts. Yeah. I got settled in and it was really great. Liam and I had talked a lot about what we, what kind of environment I wanted the room to be in and that kind of thing. And so he was a really good birth partner because he just executed things without me needing to think about it. I remember recognizing that the room was quiet and dark and peaceful, but I wasn't really aware that he had actually orchestrated that entire thing as we were getting getting in there. And so that was really nice. And the nurses were just so kind and welcoming and and got us set up. And I also really wanted to get an epidural at this point. I didn't, I guess I have nothing to compare it to. So it's hard for me to articulate, but having back labor was so intense. Yeah. I remember multiple times saying it feels like my tailbone is ripping open. What is happening? This is insane. And I, I, Liam basically massaged my lower back for 20 hours straight. It was like, he was a hero. I remember at one point being very concerned that his hands were cramping, but if he removed his hands from my body, I freaked out. Like I needed someone to have counter pressure. I know the nurses were helping with that too. It just was so uncomfortable. So I asked for an epidural. That's okay. Yeah. I asked for an epidural, but the anesthesiologist was on his way into a C-section. So I knew there was going to be a bit of a wait. And then there was a woman in in line in front of me, I guess Mm -hmm. you could say, who was waiting as well. So things progressed. I settled into this notion that it would be a couple of hours before there was any like sort of real relief from what I was feeling. I did end up getting another shot of morphine because that really did work for me, I would say like at the beginning. So they thought, okay, let's do that again and just tide you over until you can get the epidural. Long story short, I did not end up getting an epidural because by the time like I was ready to push that he, I don't know, I don't know the story of where the anesthesiologist was obviously in at this point in time, but I got to my moment and I remember the nurse just the kindest nurses in labor and delivery, side note, the best humans that I've ever encountered in my entire life. Just peace. Right? I know. And I just can't imagine just leaving after that big day and just going to eat pizza or walk your dog. Because if you didn't just take part in this kind of amazing thing that happened to somebody. So she just calmly whispered into my ear with her like nice arm on my shoulder okay, it's going to be time to push. So there's no point to get an epidural. I don't think she said there's no point, but basically said, we're going to move on from the, your epidural dreams here. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that sounds good. Let's do it. You yeah. know, and that got me to pushing. And actually I will say that once I started pushing, the pain changed and like the pressure changed and it almost was like felt better. It was a relief yeah. almost. Yeah, I yeah is that a normal thing? Uh, compare it to yes yeah, yeah. so normal and so that's everyone who's listening who hasn't given birth yet it's we're not lying to you when we say 
if you start to push, it'll feel better. No one had ever told me that, but I was glad that it was happening in the moment. Yeah. 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 And then I got to the main event, the pushing. It was about two and a half hours of really intense. At this point, I hadn't eaten in since the evening before. I was really thirsty. I was so tired, but we got it done. They kept, they'd be like, we should move your knee up here. And I would say, please move my knee for me. <laughs> my arms felt like jello. I mean, that could have been too from the morphine. I don't know, but I just, my whole body felt paralyzed in whichever way they would move me to. I'm like, okay, I live here now and I'm staying here until I had to move or do something again. But yeah, two and a half hours. And then baby Nico was here. Amazing. I know. And it was really, you know what? <sighs> like we just felt so lucky that there were no major complications. It was a really smooth, easy going, obviously painful and all those kinds of things. But as, as far as it, it goes in, in stories I've heard, we had a very easy going birth experience. They kept checking baby's heart rate and it stayed constant the entire time. And I remember at one point they said, oh, baby's cool as a cucumber, nothing's changing. And I said, oh, he's just like his dad. And everyone in the room just stopped and said, actually, no, like his mom. And yeah. I like, I feel like I could just tear up like saying that to you because it was one of the most empowering moments of my entire life where I just felt like, yeah, this is incredible. Like I'm doing this. I am making this happen. It's just a very special experience. So you're giving regardless. me regardless. Good for I know. And it's funny. I remember when we came home and there's obviously more details, but I was in the line at the post office, probably 10, Nico was probably 10 days old at this point. And I ran into my neighbor and there's a huge lineup at the post office because of COVID, you can only have two people in there, blah, blah, blah. So there's so many people outside around Christmas waiting to send their Christmas parcels. And she's, she said to me, how was your labor? Like what, how was it? And I just said, you know what? It was so dreamy and seven women in the lineup turned around and looked at me and just said, that your eyes. <laughs> yeah. They're like, we have never heard anyone use that word to describe their birth experience before. And I just said, you know what? It really, we are so lucky. That's what happened. And it just, it could have turned out in so many different ways. Even if we had come in maybe half an hour earlier or half an hour later, maybe we didn't get assigned the same nurses. Maybe we were in a different room. Maybe yeah. this, everything just fell into place for me to have a really smooth and fortunately smooth and healthy labor. It was really incredible. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. And it's really, I'm glad you're sharing this because I think sometimes people, myself included, your birth plan, my birth plan is always like epidural, but sometimes that can't happen. And it's really important to have other strategies and that hypnobirthing did it for you. I think it, it really helped. I went into it very open-minded because I waited so long to try to get pregnant. I just didn't have any of those sort of like very passionate feelings about my labor experience. And I knew I wanted to give birth in a hospital and I knew it was going to be in Victoria and everything else I just left open to what was going to happen because I didn't want to feel like something wrong was happening to me if I needed an intervention, which everybody goes into it knowing that it's for the, the health of their baby and themselves. But I didn't want to set myself up with any expectations of what was going to happen. And we had a lot of our friends who had complicated births or had their babies had some kind of health issue once they were born or this kind of thing. And we kept saying to ourselves, you know, let's just assume some curveball is going to come. And that's a really stressful way to go into it. So I don't actually suggest doing that <laughs> in hindsight, because I remember saying that to the doctor at one of my prenatal appointments. And she said, yeah, but also it's possible that nothing could happen. Like it could just be, you're going to have a healthy baby and you don't need to just spend your time waiting to go into labor, worrying about what could be. Yeah. So that worked out really well. And yeah, definitely. I didn't feel disappointed to be honest that I didn't get the epidural Okay. because I, it was not of my own. It was outside of my control. It wasn't like I was choosing not to have it. And then I regretted not doing it or I had it. And then I regretted having yeah. it or whatever. It just was not an option for me. So you yeah. 
just your mind immediately switches to say, okay, that's off the table. What else am I going to do to power through this experience? And you just do it at that point. What are you going to do? It's happening. You're doing it. You're doing it. Exactly. Hey, Sarah, do you know what I've never asked you? Did you take a prenatal course when you were pregnant? We did. Even though I'm a maternity care provider, my husband and I thought it would be an important process for us to go through together. That's so cute. (laughs) It must have been so hard for you guys to coordinate your busy schedules, though. Oh, tell me about it. I was a medical resident at the time, and he was working full-time. We really struggled to find a course that would fit our needs and ended up doing a semi-private course that still was challenging to schedule and quite expensive. Wouldn't it have been nice for you guys to have access to an online course with evidence-based content that you could do from the comfort of your own home or on your own time at your own pace? You're telling me. If I had had access to something like our Pregnancy to Parenthood prenatal masterclass, it would have been a game changer. And that's the big reason we put this course together, to provide parents with access to a reliable, comprehensive prenatal education from the comfort of their own homes and the ability to watch it and re-watch it when and where they choose. Plus, it's got so much great information about preparing for the fourth trimester, which I'll admit, I felt really unprepared for. We focus so much on labor and birth when we're pregnant without understanding how challenging breastfeeding in the fourth trimester can be. I hear ya. And that's why we put together such a comprehensive module all about what to expect for the fourth trimester and for your newborn. If any of you listeners are pregnant and thinking about a prenatal course, I may be biased, but I would 100% recommend our online course. Head on over to www dot shefoundhealth.ca backslash masterclass to check it out. We promise you won't be disappointed or your money back. So how did things go postpartum with you and little Nico and your team and all the other things? Really well too. We've had our challenges for sure. Feeding, breastfeeding has been pretty much smooth sailing. I would say mostly it was just really hard on my body physically like my posture, my, I have a lot of back pain and it's better now that I've gained strength, but at the beginning it was really hard. And I know they always say, bring baby to the breast, but that just seems like really difficult. I was always hunching over and he's so little and they're so fragile and you just, you know, are scared to move them and that kind of thing. But we stayed in Victoria for a couple of like, I guess, five days. So Nico was born on a Monday and we drove back to Tofino on Saturday the following Saturday. So baby's first road trip, just five days old. So we thought that was going to be really stressful, but it actually ended up being pretty smooth sailing too. We stopped at a couple of different places on the way up Island and visited friends and just to feed the baby and have something to eat and then got home. And I was really lucky to my mom, our parents, both of our sets of parents live in the maritime. So they're quite far away. Yeah. So my parents live in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. And Liam's parents live in Prince Edward Island. I'm from PEI. You are? You know that? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, where? where? I'm sure, big city of Charlottetown. Oh, yeah. They're from Kensington area. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's really not that far. One of my good no. friends from Kensington, Rose Cousins, she's a musician. Shout out to Rose. Oh, I think um, I've heard of her before, actually. Hilarious and has a beautiful voice. Um, she's Interesting. From- yeah. Oh, it's such a small world, isn't it? It is. And I lived in Halifax for 10 years. I did not oh. and everything there. I know. Amazing. Okay. Yep. See, it all right. just, yeah, well, I mean, this is just how it is. Yep. So you have no immediate family, which is not uncommon. No, no, exactly. But my mom was able to come out for the whole month of December. So oh. just for context, Nico was born on the 22nd of November. She came out on the 1st of December and stayed for the whole month. And then my dad and my brother flew out just for 10 days around Christmas. So we had immediate support. which was so important and so nice. And just, we live in a house with multiple units and there's a vacation rental like right across the hall. So they rented the vacation rental. So we could just walk back and forth through the door. So she was able to have her privacy and we just live in a one bedroom apartment anyway. So it would have been really hectic with a fresh baby, but yeah, it just was so nice. So the transition back to Tofino felt really good. And yeah, I just, I feel like everything that I experienced, I really owe it to the like quality healthcare 
professionals that I've encountered and the public health nurses here came to visit almost immediately. They were, they called me right away when we got home to set up their first visit. They came a couple of times, even just last week, Nico went on a bit of a nursing strike and I was freaking out and I ended up just chatting with them for half an hour, talking about what could be happening. And they really talked me off the ledge because that's a really stressful Mm -hmm. experience. I was worried about feeling disconnected or isolated being in such a remote place, but I've actually had a really the opposite of opposite experience because we have our family doctor here. We have access to these amazing public health nurses and we've had family come and visit. Liam's parents have now been out to visit just recently for a couple of weeks. And it really made all the difference kind of settling into that new new life with a new baby, which is just such a shock for everybody. And I, I, do, I do that. Yeah. Like, exactly. I'm hearing the, like your head exploding. Like head exploding. I like round on the postpartum unit with new families because it's just like nothing. And I don't say this to be paternalistic, but like just nothing can compare, can prepare you for it. Like you just no, exactly. A good friend of mine, we just had dinner with them the other night and she kept asking like, has it been what you imagined your experience with having a new baby? And both Leo and I just said, we had no idea. There was no, I had no expectation. I had no idea what it was going to be like other than knowing that there would be sleepless nights and that it was going to be very challenging. All of these things I had, there's no way to know. Yeah. Because it's so different for everybody. And even if you meet your friend's babies when they're a day old or two days old, every experience ends up being different. Every baby is different. Every, the way you react to situations is different. So there's just really no way to prepare other than making sure that you have all the things you need. And information, the people, the support. Exactly. And cute onesies help too. Yeah. (laughs) Cute diapers, maybe. Cute jammies. Yeah. So Laura, what would you say for you? What was the best part about your journey into care? I think the main theme I've just been saying before, I just felt like I, I rallied a community around me and it really helped me feel so supported in the moment. I felt like if anything challenging had arisen, we were well taken care of. And it really kept me going for those first like few weeks, the first month and a half or two months when all the hormones are like going crazy and you're so tired and in shock and unaware of what's going on. All of those things really carried me through that first little time of feeling really confident in the decisions I was making, feeling confident, asking for help and just feeling so proud of myself for giving birth and getting through it and having this really beautiful baby in our lives now. So it, it really, when I think back on the whole experience, it really just, we just felt so supported. And I really hope that everybody can feel some sense of that in that experience, because I can't imagine it's would be so challenging to feel like you didn't have anyone in your corner helping you out. It's you're in such a vulnerable state and you're just yeah, overcome with physically recovering, depending on what happened. I was very lucky. I only had a couple of stitches. I had really minimal tearing. So my recovery was quite easy as well. So yeah, just I'm rambling, but no, I think it, you get the point. And like community. It's community. so important. Yeah. Well, and the pandemic has taken a lot of that away from people. I think. I think so. It's so challenging. Only now are like kind of mom groups starting to happen again in town, which I'm really excited about starting to get involved with that and meet other moms. Because even if I'm not alone, I feel alone or lonely or isolated at times in the middle of the night when I'm up feeding the baby and I'm so tired and I just feel alone and vulnerable and sad or whatever. And then I just think, you know what, there's a whole community of women who are up at the same time doing this exact same thing, feeling the same way. It's so true. Like, you know, I just picture like, can you imagine staring down at the planet and seeing like a little glow everywhere? There's a mom up. I know there's a poem I read, actually. I don't, I can't think of the name right now. I'll, if I find it, it, I'll I'll send it to you. I I read it. It's exactly that. It's basically just like the thought of women having switchboard beside them and the lights come on 
with everybody who's up at that time. And just so you know that you're not alone in this experience. And I was really fortunate as well. I have two very good friends of mine who don't live anywhere near me. One lives in Nelson, BC, and the other one lives in Australia, but they both had babies in early January, actually just one, one day apart from each other. At any given time in a 24 hour clock, one of us yes. is is awake or doing something. So we have a really amazing group chat that even though we're not physically together, we feel very close and we can support each other and that kind of thing. Yeah, I would say just having that community is really the highlight for me of it just brought me closer to so many people. Yeah. And I really like you say like the community doesn't have to be physically with you. No. With my first, one of my dearest friends lives in in Ontario, in Kingston, and she had kids just before me. And honestly, she was one of my biggest supports because she was just texting me the realness yeah, and normalizing some of the, the emotions I was feeling and the challenges that I was having. And it made me realize how not alone I was. And she wasn't, it was just text, right? Exactly. If you're remote. If you're not surrounded by your close friends, like you can still be supported by them. It's true. And even yeah. if you're, maybe you are surrounded by all your friends and family, but none of them have kids or really? and don't know what the best way to support you is, or maybe, yeah, you know, everybody's situation is different. So it's nice to be able to have that community. And I would say that's something that I found really helpful with you, this platform that, that you have, because it is, there's so many good resources and it seems to me like I always make jokes about my phone listening to me, but it's like something happens and I, it's, I'm Googling it or I'm doing something, talking about it. And the next thing you're like, oh, did you know we have a podcast about this <laughs> subject? And I'm like, oh, great. I was actually just wondering about that. Even that online community, and I'm not a huge social media person, but I really have found that those, these accounts and these platforms have made me feel much more aware, educated, closer to other people going through this experience. Well, it's so great to hear. I'm so yeah, glad. It's you know, that's great. the whole reason we put this community together. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. For Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's a pretty neat thing to reflect on and talk about. Wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's wonderful. And I think every woman and every birthing person should be given that opportunity because you'll never forget. I remember almost every detail of every one of my births. Yeah. It's just a, yeah, it's a life-changing experience. That's cliche to say. And there's probably so many other things I could have told you about that day that I've left out, but it's a moment in time that I often come back to and reflect on it in my mind when things are hard or when I just am thinking about it. I'm preparing to chat with you today has really given me a lot of time to reflect on it and think yeah. about those little details. I'm going to make sure that I write it down too, so that mm -hmm. if I ever feel like I don't remember, I can always revisit yeah. that and re-feel that empowerment that I felt in that day because it was really a, an incredible life experience for me. And I feel so fortunate because I know it does not go that way for everybody. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And to be someone who helps women and pregnant people birth. Oh, it feels, it's amazing. I can't, yeah, I can't even imagine. And the, Every the time I'm like, this is incredible. I know. <laughs> and that's what I find so crazy. And that's what Liam and I were just laughing. Like we were having, this is the biggest day of our entire lives. And this is just an, another day of work for people, but it's just such a special thing. And then to just know that they're leaving and like taking a shower. And like I said, going to eat pizza or walk their dog is just like, it's a special kind of human that can pull that off. And it's not an always easy job. No, for sure. And I, I can imagine it, it can be very hard and very traumatizing and it's hard work. It's long days and that kind of thing for us. That was like the main, we just were so impressed with all of you and the healthcare professionals that deal with new moms and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty incredible. Well, we're lucky to be able to do this work. And I'm yeah. so lucky to have had the opportunity to meet you and hear your story. Thank you. You as well. Thank you for sharing. And I'm glad to have you part of our community. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.foundhealth.ca 
found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.